Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to ELC three two zero four. This is a recording for lecture six of the optical part. Um, so before I start, I hope you didn't uh go to the uh classroom in um on on Tuesday. So basically, the the teaching content uh content of um the optical part um was uh, meant to be de delivered in uh, seven lectures and then uh we know in the past we normally organize two hours a uh, tour to the clean room but this year because of the two bank holidays we just canceled uh that tour so all the contents all the knowledge they are introduced as a as a pace uh that, that is meant to be so it's not it's not rushed it is uh uh how it's meant to be uh delivered um so anyway uh let's uh start by um revisiting the atomic concepts uh, from last week so basically we have three levels uh, for for that the first level is atom so basically for an atom, we have a neutron, proton, and electron. And for electrical, for electrical neutrality, we need to have the same number of protons as the number of uh, electrons. So this defines a uh, chem chemical property. And then uh, for uh, chemical stability, uh, it is decided by the number of electrons. So specific specifically, um, the so number of electrons on the outmost shell of uh, atom should be eight, so that it is chemically uh, stable. However, atoms uh, don't often have eight uh, electrons on its outmost shell, so they have to form bond so that they can share their electrons. So this leads us to the second level material. So we have bonding. Uh, the first, oh, so there are other types of bonding as well. For the purpose of this, this course, we introduced two types of bonding. The first type is uh, metallic uh, bonding. For metals, uh, normally uh, there are either one, two, or three electrons on the out outmost shell of uh, an, atom, an atom. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the atoms that have very weak hold uh to the electrons so those electrons in the metallic bonds they can wander free um so they are, they are all free electrons and then covalent uh bond is completely 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 different so all the uh so for example we have silicon um atoms they have they normally have they they have four electrons on their outmost shell so each atom is bonded with uh, four other atoms you can see eight lines that coming out of one um uh, one atom so they are the paths for the shared electrons those electrons are called uh, valence electrons or bonding electrons they can travel freely within the bonding structure but not freely outside of the bonding structure so when this bonding, this uh, covalent bonding is formed, um, so all the electrons are, they are quite uh, so so the for the chemical state it's quite stable, and uh, for chemical neutrality it is also uh, neutral because we uh, overall we still have the same number of uh, uh, protons as the number of uh, electrons. And also, each each atoms have access to eight electrons on their outermost shell, and uh, the electrons uh, that can travel in the bonding structure are called uh, valence electron or bonding electron. They are known to be on the valence uh, energy uh, uh, valence energy band, so they are quite stable. However, we need electrons to jump up and down between valence band and uh, uh, conduction band so that we can either emit light or absorb uh, energy. So what we normally do is we do doping. 
So for a p-type doping, we have an atom that have uh, three electrons on its outermost shell. So in terms of chemical neutrality, we only need three electrons uh, because we, we only have three protons uh, in the atom. However, in terms of chemical uh, stability for the bonding structure, we need one more electrons. So here we say we have one hole to uh, one one hole too many because we have a place in the bonding structure that needs one more electron. But if we actually get one more electron for the sake of bonding structure, then it is not chemical uh, neutral anymore because we still only have three protons. By contrast, we have uh, n-type uh, doping where one uh, atom has uh, three, uh, sorry, have five uh, electrons. So it has one extra electron, one electron too, too much for the bonding structure. So for the chemical neutrality, we still need uh, five electrons because we have five uh, protons. But for the bonding uh, structure, there's no, no place for this extra electron. So this electron is uh, tempted to, uh, to travel away. But when it's actually traveled away for the chemical neutrality, we, uh, it becomes unbalanced. So, uh, so when the bonding structure is broken, then an electron, a valence electron, bonding ele electron is excited onto the conduction band. So this creates a hole on the valence band, which means on the valence band, we have this uh, attraction of uh, getting the free electron back. So the electron on the conduction band is not on a stable state, is on a high energy state. So eventually it will come down. So for uh, so, so, so for valence band, we have uh, three holes. And then for the conduction band, we have three electrons. So uh, the degree of freedom to make electrons to move up and down uh, give, us a, give us the possibility of building a semiconductor in order to absorb uh, either absorb light or emit light. So we can either forward bias uh, or apply forward bias or uh, reverse bias. So for forward bias, uh, we have a negative uh, contact connected to the N type, which have a lot of uh, free electrons. So the negative contact will expel the free electrons to move to the other direction, the so positive, positive contact on the other side. So when electron pass uh, the depletion region, which is the middle region, the barrier, then uh, the free electron will, com uh, will combine with the free hole. So the electron give up its energy, give up its quantum of energy. And this quantum of energy Will produce photon that's uh, light so this is the only way that we can emit light which is when uh, a free electron give up its energy so here we have uh, the conduction band and we have the valence band so the level of energy for the conduction band is different for different types of material it's the same for the uh, valence band so the depletion region is a middle region. So bars applied here is to uh, expel the free electrons to the other side. So the depletion region is minimized. Um, so basically what it does here is to push either uh, both electrons and the holes to their opposite directions. So we say, uh, we move uh, carriers to their minority size. So both free electrons and the free holes, they are also called uh, carriers because they create current. So electrons that are expelled to move to uh, the P side, P type side, where there is little 
uh, free electrons. So the free electrons on the P side is a minority side. So we push electrons to its minority side. Similarly, the free holes they are attracted by the negative contact on the N side. So on N type side, uh, holes they are minorities. So we are pushing our free holes to its uh, to their minority side. And when they cross over the depletion band, um, the free electrons and the free holes, they will combine and produce light. By contrast, in order to absorb light, we have a reverse bias, where the negative contact, so where the positive contact is connected to the n-type uh, part, which contain a lot of free electrons. So this means the positive contact they will hold the electron as strong as possible. So this enlarge the depletion, depletion region because the uh, free electrons they are, they are held very strongly by the positive contact. And then all the free holes in the P type side, they are, they are held very strongly by the negative contact. So the depletion region is maximized if you expose this region to a uh, uh, optical signal, then in the depletion region, we can absorb a quantum of energy, which creates a new pair of uh, free electrons and free holes. And when the free electron is created here, it will be attracted to the n-type side that connected to the uh, positive contact because electrons are attracted uh, by the positive contact. And the free holes that are attracted to uh, the p-type side. So we say here that we move carriers to their majority side because there are a lot of electrons here and the free electron will be attracted to the positive contact here. So, uh, So, so these are the three levels of uh, the basic concepts for uh, basic atomic concepts. I hope it's uh, uh, I, ho I hope I can, I can help. Um, so basically, it's it is very challenging to put everything on one piece of paper. A few years ago, all the research proposals submitted to Rose Society, for example, are required to summarize uh, the research. In uh, on on one page, it's actually very challenging because every sentence needs to be very well thought, and all the figures they have to be many um, uh, very carefully designed. Um, so uh, if you if you read uh, materials, um, if you read uh, textbooks, for example, uh, they sometimes have have uh, different names for the same thing. For example, bonding uh, electron and the uh, valence electron, they are the same thing. And we have electrons in the valence band, but we, some, we often say we have electrons on the uh, conduction band and the holes on the valence band. So there is no actually physical e e existence of holes. There's physical existence of protons, uh, neutrons, and electrons. So holes is kind of um, the absence of a free electron. So when an electron is excited onto the uh, conduction band, then there is an electron missing from the valence band. We call it a hole. Okay, so it could be quite confusing, but I hope um, uh, this summary uh, makes sense to you. Okay, so. Um, so the, uh, so the exam uh, of the optical part will focus on two aspects. One part is uh, the simple equations from optical detector, uh, which I cover a little bit in the in-person teaching on uh, this Tuesday because I didn't finish everything about the optical detector uh, on, on, on Tuesday, uh, sorry, Thursday last week. Um, but I uh, did finish it in the recording. So if you uh, want to uh, listen, uh, listen back the optical detector part, uh, please refer to the recording for lecture five. 
So another part of the exam is about a uh, concept of uh, uh, modulation, optical modulation. So we uh, so th we will cover this part uh, today for this uh, recording uh, for recording for lecture six and seven. Uh, so basically, for this part, there will be no equations, but sometimes you, you are required to uh, uh, to draw a diagram of a concept. For example, how does MZM works, and then you need to explain how does MZM works. So this is what we are going to cover today. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have discussed before that uh, for laser uh, light source, uh, it, we, we can directly modulate uh, the log logical one or logical zero by turning on and off the laser. But that will give us uh, power variations and also turn on delay. Because at the beginning of uh, turning on, you need to pump a lot of electrons from the valence band to the uh, to the conduction band, so this causes a delay. And then a lot of electrons they will fall down to the valence band and emit light, and then there are not in enough electrons on the conduction band again. You need to pump, uh, keep pumping electrons uh, to the uh, to the conduction band. So at the beginning, the, there is power, power variation where you have enough electron, and then you don't have enough electron, and then you have enough electron. So if you do detection based on this uh, uh, signal power, uh, sometimes it, it would create uh, uh, a variation in signal to noise ratio. So what we normally do is once we turn on the laser, we keep it on all the time. Uh, so its power is constant. And then we use an uh, uh, external optical modulator to, to modulate data onto the incoming uh, optical signal. So how do we do that? We normally use uh, MZM. So basically, we have uh, incoming uh, optical signal, and then split it in two. And then for the two arms, we have different refraction index, N. So the two light, uh, two optical signals, they travel at different distances, and then they combine again uh, on the on the other side. And uh, if uh, they are in phase, they'll they'll add together constructively, and that that will represent logical one. And if uh, they uh, interfere destructively, then it will represent uh, optical zero. So we have we will have three levels of MZM uh, uh, design. So in the exam, if uh, you're asked to uh, explain how MZM uh, uh, works, uh, you get uh, some marks for describing the first level and more marks for uh, describing the second level and third level. So the first level is uh, is like this. So based on the optical e electro property, when you apply uh, electrical field onto the material, it will change the refraction index. So basically, it will change the propagation speed of optical light. How does that happen? So light has uh, uh, electrical field and magnetic field. So basically, if you forward bias uh, this material, then it will uh, speed up the light propagation. If you reverse bias, this uh, light, then you 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 will uh, slow down the light propagation. So the two light signals they travel at different speed, and then they combine to together uh, either constructively or destructively based on your design. So basically, you have external electrical signal here, uh, electrical contact for the two sides, uh, and you have metal strips uh, that form e electrical field. So in one arm, so refraction refractive index will increase, and the, in the other, it will decrease. This means optical signal will travel slower in one arm and faster in another arm, and then the signal is recombined here, and they will interfere. 
So the interference effect caused very large uh, variation in the amplitude, in the output amplitude. So the high amplitude will represent logical one, and low amplitude will represent logical zero. So, um, so if if we look at this figure, uh, so if we have a positive charge, a negative charge, and then the wiring here means charge, a negative charge, and then the wiring here means that we have positive on 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 here on the first metal strip and positive here. And then the bottom one is negative, and this bottom one is negative. So for the two uh, phase shifters, that, is, that 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 can impose phase, uh, phase shift on the optical phase. So I have two phase shifters. It's always it, it seems to be always positive on the top and negative on the bottom. So which one is forward biased? Which one is reverse biased? How do we forward bias uh, one arm and reverse bias one arm? So one way is to uh, dope differently. So if we dope uh, one arm P N, and then another arm N P, then one arm is forward biased, another is reverse biased. Okay. So that's the principle. In reality, when we when we buy uh, so in reality, very often yeah, both arms are reverse bars, and uh, but we dope them uh, differently. We dope them with different levels of uh, P and N, so that uh, the reverse bar. So when reverse bars happened, the positive and negative contacts will hold uh, the electrons and holes as strong as possible. So this reduce the speed of uh, electrical field, re reduce the speed of light propagation. So we have different levels of uh, bias. So we either dope them um, differently, or sometimes when we buy a material, the two arms, they may be uh, doped uh, in the same way. Then we change the lens of uh, this uh, strip. So if it's a shorter lens, then it interact with the optical signal for shorter per period of time, so it impose a uh, less uh, fa uh, phase shift. And if I have longer uh, metal strip, then it, it would interact with optical signal for longer period of time, it will impose a larger phase shift. Another question, what, what factor would uh, limit um, the achievable rate? So we did mention this a little bit earlier. So basically, this is capacitance. We charge, discharge, it will cause delay. Another very important thing that we didn't mention last time was that when we impose current here, uh, uh, sorry, electrical signal here, it will go this way, and it will go this way. An optical signal would travel this way, right? So what we really want is that when we apply optical signal, when we apply optical signal, we really want the optical signal to travel towards the same direction as, sorry, the, on, the, on the metal strips we have electrical signal. So we want electrical signal to travel uh, to, towards the same direction as the optical signal. So that they interact for a longer period of time which means we apply electrical field for a longer period of time, okay? So we want electrical signal to be imposed to travel uh, to one direction. So that would lead, lead us to the second level. So if we look at this figure first, we have uh, electrical signal imposed uh, from here, and then it would travel uh, towards the same direction as the optical signal. In this way, the optical signal and uh, the electrical signal will interact for a longer period of time. So if the electrical signal travels this way, it would interact with the optical signal for a shorter period of time. That's why we want this. And this is uh, implemented by transmission line. 
transmission line. So basically for transmission line, uh, you don't you don't need to remember the details of transmission line. Uh, the important thing is we put termin termination in the end. So why? So for transmission line, basically we have inductors, capacitors, and then uh, uh, electrical signal will travel this way. So I have a characteristic impedance of the transmission line. For the whole transmission line, we have um, for the whole uh, uh, transmission line, we have this uh, characteristic uh, impedance. So what we need to do is we need to match a resistor uh, at the end so that the electrical signal would travel this way without being reflected back. So optical signal will always travel this way. Sorry, electrical signals will always travel this way on the transmission line. So this is called impedance uh, matching. So that's why we have terminator here, which impedance matched to the transmission line. Okay, so in, in, uh, transmission line and uh, termination. And the uh, phase shifter is a pair of uh, metal strips. So this is a phase shifter, and the bottom, this is a phase shifter. We impose two uh, electrical signals, one here and one here. And inside, we have the wires uh, connected to uh, two metal strips. So the wiring here is simpler than before. So if you look at the first level here, so the so wiring needs to cross the arm, right? But now the wiring is uh, kind of simpler. We don't need to cross um, uh, the arms. So basically, we have metal strip area that are arranged as uh, transmission line. So this is transmission line. And then electrical input is an impedance uh, matched to the plate counter areas, which means electrical signal uh, come in from here and then we have termination on the other side so that electrical signal wouldn't be reflected back. And then electrical signal uh, travel down the waveguide. In, so basically electrical signal would travel uh, the, uh, at, uh, on this direction. And then optical signal would travel, travel in the arm uh, at the same direction. So they interact with, for a longer period of time. So this is more efficient. So advantage in summary, we have uh, the device more efficient. And uh, we, uh, therefore we can apply lower voltage because even if we apply lower voltage, the electrical field would be applied to uh, optical signal for a longer period of time because of the longer interaction period of time. And this also simplifies the wiring. Um, so there's no crossing uh, the arms uh, for the wiring. And this makes possible higher modulation rates. So later on, we will look at um, higher modulation level, which is uh, just based on this, uh, this level of uh, MZM modulation. So this is, this is a second level of MZM uh, configuration. It is also called wave configuration. So before we introduce the third level of MZM, uh, let's come back to the theoretical model, theory of MZM. So basically we have optical signal for the both arms. And then as, a, as the other side, when we combine the two signals together, the optical power is a cosine function of the phase difference between two arms. So the transfer function is a cosine function. So we have the electrical signal in and then mapped by this uh, uh, transfer function. And then the electrical signal out is like this. So V pi describes the voltage and then the electrical signal out is like this. 
So very high described the voltage required to support this uh, this region of pi. The problem is this transfer function is not strictly linear. So for example, if four levels of modulation, if I have four levels, the middle, uh, the middle of the eye is wider than the eyes uh, as a side. This is because uh, that the transfer function here is not linear, especially uh, when it's closer to the two ends. So what we do is we need to adjust uh, the center point, the bars, and we need to adjust amplitude so that we only use a selected segment of the transfer function that is approximately linear. So here, after adjusting various points and amplitude, we have uh, this eye diagram. Uh, sorry, here, this is optical. So eye diagram, that would be uh, eco-spaced. If I properly adjust the bars and uh, reference. Okay, so how to adjust a uh, bars uh, point? We use heater. So basically we use heater to adjust a uh, bias point. So this is uh, the third level of MZM. We basically just add a uh, heater to the second level, which use transmission line and then terminator. So we need additional electrodes fabric fabricated within heater region. So here, and then we'll, we'll apply extra DC voltage uh, to the heaters. So that we create these bars. So uh, last time I provided you with uh, my lab code for MZN. So on one arm, the uh, face rotation is uh, modulated as theta amplitude. And then on the other arm, we modulate the face, uh, optical face uh, as theta reference minus theta amplitude. So for this case, we have, uh, if the reference is half of the pi, and if we have two arms, both have their faces modulated, then the amplitude should be uh, very pi, uh, pi, uh, pi over four, because the whole region is pi. If we only modulate one arm, then the amplitude should be pi over two. There are other ways to modulate two arms. This is just an example. If you look back to the, um, to the MATLAB code I provided you last time, you will see uh, how we modulated the uh, MZN, um, how we modulate uh, the phase difference between two arms. And then for the extinction uh, ratio, so I have uh, I diagram here. So if it's only two levels, so this is uh, so the top level is uh, the optical power for logical one, and then bottom level is uh, the optical power for logical zero. So extinction, extinction ratio uh, is a ratio between the optical power for logical one uh, and optical power for logical zero. And then average power is average between these two. Okay. So, uh, so if we look at uh, four levels of uh, modulation, so palm four, we need to modulate uh, four levels of amplitude by two binary bits. So if it's zero, zero is this level, uh, probably zero, one, one, zero, one, one. 
right? So we input two bits and modulate two levels. So first bit um, is, is input from here, and then second bit is input from here. We need delays to match the propagation of uh, optical signal. And then for the first level, we have shorter uh, metal strips so that we modulate the lower um, amplitude level. And then the second bit determines the higher amplitude level. So I have longer um, metal strips. So basically how POM4 works is we have four amplitudes and it demands two logical bits. So I have two segments. We have independent uh, timing control. So we delay uh, the first one and then delay the second one according to the optical signal propagation delay. So we modulate this first and then this next. Um, and uh, the lens here is not exactly half of this one because the transfer function is not exactly linear. So sometimes we need only one segment of the function, or alternatively, we can just vary the ratio between uh, uh, between half of the amplitude uh, and the, amplitude, uh, the, the higher amplitude. Okay. So if I have POM16, we will have four bits, and then the process is the same. So if we go back, it would be like we have 16 amplitude levels and it demands um, four logical bits. So we have four delays imposed onto the four phase shifters. We have four delays. Okay. So come back to uh, um, uh, return to zero and non return to zero. So basically, uh, if I look at here, so basically, return to zero is non return to zero multiply a clock signal. So the so, uh, high here is high, low, and then zero is just zero, and then high is high, low, high, low. So the advantage of doing this is that we create more edges. So the receiver knows better uh, where where is the start of uh, a pulse. It would uh, help the synchronization. So if we do not have a lot of edges, for example, we transmit a long zero, long sequence of zeros, then the receiver would be confused. Um, the, the receiver wouldn't know if um, the off state is uh, is uh, carrying uh, logical zeros or simply switched off for not transmitting anything. So a return to zero would create more edges. That's good for synchronization. But the drawback is that the pulse duration is half of the original pulse duration, which means the bandwidth doubled. So whenever we reduce uh, the period in time domain, we, so whenever we reduce uh, the period in time domain, we double the bandwidth. So here we can see that if we want 40 gigabits per hertz, uh, sorry, g uh, 40 uh, gigabits per second data rate, then for RZ, we need 40 gigahertz bandwidth, but for NRZ, we only need half of the bandwidth. So how do we modulate RZ? We modulate this by two uh, MCM. So bas basically it's like this. So the first MCM is in charge of the clock signal. And then the second MCM is in charge uh, by, uh, sorry, the data signal is in charge by a second uh, MCM. So 
uh, earlier we said that the transfer function is a cosine function. But sometimes after we purchase a device, we would shift it by pi. So we have uh, this shape. Sometimes we use left-hand side. Sometimes we use right-hand side. This all depends on the device because very often when we uh, got when we purchase um, the device, uh, its transfer function is not ideal. So eventually we only want to use a uh, part of the transfer function that, it, that can get us uh, or desired output signal. So sometimes we shift the transfer function by pi. Sometimes we use half, uh, left hand side. Sometimes we use right hand side. Theoretically, they are all equivalent. In practice. In practice, um, we just try uh, one way that can give us the best result. Okay, so for example, if we use uh, left-hand side here, when the input signal is something like this, so input is like this, and then output is like this. So we use 40 uh, gigahertz, um, electrical signal to drive um, MZM. And then the optical output, uh, for the optical output, the period is peak to peak. So I have 25 picosecond here. So bandwidth is also 40. So as, as we said earlier that uh, um, for non-return to zero, we only need half of the bandwidth. So how can we uh, also use half of the bandwidth for return to zero? We use the whole region of two-way pi. So what would happen is that at the beginning, we use the linear region on the left-hand side, and then the output is like this. Originally, if we only use left-hand side, so falling output would be like this, right? But now we use a right-hand side that reverse the transfer function of the left-hand side. So what will happen is the output would be like this for the first half, and then it would go up again for the second half. So the peak to peak uh, time period So we reduced, which means we use half of the bandwidth, but we get double uh, uh, bandwidth for the output signal because the period is half of, of this. So for this one, for this output, the period is here from peak to peak. But here we only have this peak to peak. So it's actually basically here, peak to peak. The bandwidth is 40 gigahertz, but only used 20 gigahertz to drive the MZM. Question, why don't we just use two-way pi all the time so that we only require half of the bandwidth? So uh, the answer is that when we use two-way pi, it requires quite large uh, voltage. So it's not uh, very efficient. And also uh, the transfer function is not always ideal like this. So it could cause us problem. So basically to way pi, uh, the power requirement is quite high. So we don't, do not use it all the time. But rule of thumb is that when we use two way pi, two way pi, then we only need half of the bandwidth to drive the MZM. So uh, the transfer function can also be like this. This is the original uh, cosine function. It is shifted uh, pi from here. So basically this, uh, whether we kind of uh, bears at maximum like this, or bears at minimum like this, it really depends on how, uh, so when we got, when we get um, the Amazon device, how do we, uh, uh, so, so how, how does the transfer function look like? Okay, so in summary, 
whenever we drive with two-way pi, we only need half of the bundle ways. That's, that's the first paragraph here. The second paragraph is we have two uh, transfer uh, functions, either look like this or the cosine. They are just shifted by pi. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, after clock, we have another MZN to modulate uh, data. But now clock only require uh, 20 gigahertz to drive uh, first MZN. Uh, so the transfer function can be shifted by by pi. So that's uh, that's that. In summary, we have Rz and then we have nRz. Rz would have shorter pulses, uh, high low. Um, the consequence of this is that we reduce the period for each pulse, and it requires doubled bandwidth. So in order to uh, to avoid using doubled uh, bandwidth for the electrical signal, we use two-way pi. Okay, so another thing we are going to, the last thing we are going to learn uh, today, uh, for, sorry, for lecture uh, six, is uh, uh, dual binary code. So sometimes we do a little bit manipulation on the uh, binary beats, uh, we call it coding. Uh, sometimes it's for uh, better noise resistance. Sometimes it's for uh, favorable spectrum properties. So here, uh, this code is called a uh, dual binary code. So how does it work? So I have the input binary data on the first row and the A, First of all, it's in initialized as uh, zero. Okay, so for the first uh, period, we have a we have XOR uh, operation on the binary data and a. So the first two rows produce the third row. So for XOR, we have zero 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 one. Uh, one zero one, and then one one zero. So this is to perform X or to the first two rows, and then we get B. And then B is delayed for one period of time and become A for the next time. So this B would become A for the next time. Uh, ne next uh bit a uh, symbol period. So output is a adding b so this is at which means uh, you have uh this row adding this row so zero zero we have zero one zero we have one and then for one one zero one zero we have one and then for one one we will we'll have two so this is not binary anymore so the encoded data, these, these are not binary anymore. So we use uh, this uh, data to drive MZM. So we, we do not, it, it's not binary anymore. The encoded data contains zero, one, and two. So we use two-way pi. So zero is uh, minus pi, one is pi. Two is mapped to uh sorry, uh one is mapped to zero, and then zero is mapped to minus pi, and then two is mapped to a uh, pi. So in this way, the output so the input zero correspond to output optical on, and then input uh one. Is mapped to the output optical uh, optical off, and then input two is mapped to the output optical on. So eventually, for the optical signal, we only have on and off. So if we look at it, we have the 
for the binary uh, dual, uh, dual binary encoder, we have the binary input, and then the encoded data contains 0, 1, and 2. And then this is mapped to 0 pi and the minus pi. And uh, after and then, we have on and off. So whenever we have a zero, we have off. Whenever we have either pi or minus pi, we have on. Okay, so if we map on and off back to binary one or zero, and then apply a kind of flip, we, we flip on and off. So we, we do a reverse here. Then one become zero, zero become one. We can see that uh, this recovers the original binary data. So we have zero, zero here, followed by three ones, and then two zeros, and then one, zero, one, zero, one. This is the same as the first row. So why did we go through all this trouble? Uh, to drive NZM by two-way pi. The reason is that rule of thumb, when we use two-way pi, the spectrum become narrower. Okay, so sometimes even for non-return to zero, we also use uh, two-way pi because the spectrum is narrower. This causes a few uh, lesser interference to other optical channels. Okay, so that's all for lecture uh, six.